Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. And today, Lily Liu of the AARP is joining us to talk about the organization's 60th anniversary, which is taking place this year, and specifically about its founder, a woman who a lot of people may never have heard of as the founder of AARP. Thank you for being here. Oh, thank you, Catherine, very much for the opportunity to be here. My colleagues in the AARP Virginia office down in Richmond presented this opportunity to me, and of course I grabbed it. AARP State Director down in AARP Virginia State Office is Jim Dow, and we have a staff member here, Amber Saltani. And when they gave me this chance, I said I must come on, because as you had said, many people do not know that AARP, founded in 1958, celebrates its 60th anniversary this year. It will be a year-long celebration from July of, nine, of 2018 to July of 2019. But the most important thing is that people do not know AARP was founded by a woman. I would not have known that because yes. I've never thought about it. Yes, her name was Ethel Percy Andrus. She was a retired educator. And so what's so fascinating is that for the past 20 years, I've had a chance to analyze and research her life. And I realize that it really is powerful, number one, her life story. And then number two, it really could resonate with all of us, the baby boomers of our generation, who are women trying to seek our way in the world. So I wanted to turn around and ask you, on your website, you have two very key points that were points of Ethel Percy Andrus' life. One, that one person can make a difference, and two, the power of community. Could you explain to me why those resonated with you? Well, it's very interesting. I read a book some time ago um, called The Happiness Hypothesis, oh. which is written by Jonathan Haidt, a former um, professor at UVA. And mm -hmm. The Happiness Hypothesis really looked at what made people happy. Uh -huh. And he came up with the end of the book with some um, posits, some ideas about that. One is that people want to be autonomous, and that is the power of the individual. Uh -huh. That people need to be connected to a community mm. because we are social animals. And so being connected to a community is also very important. And spirituality. Uh -huh. Spirituality being that we recognize that there is something greater than ourselves. And I truly believe he's onto something. And so I do believe one person can make an enormous impact. But I think our happiness comes from being in a community and recognizing that that community and our individual efforts are about something much larger than ourselves. Oh, that is really powerful. I think it really resonates with the life of Ethel Percy Andrus. She was a school teacher. She started out as a school teacher in Chicago, born in 1884, so a woman of the 19th century who would live into her 80s, pass away in July of 1967. So what a narrative arc for her life. Yeah, that is, she saw a lot of change in that time. She did, and she said, like you've often said, the only constant is change. Absolutely. But she rolled with the punches. So what's so interesting is, number one, she was one individual who made a difference. She went from a career in education, and it was only in retirement that she founded both the NRTA, which was called the National Retired Teachers Association in 1947, and then AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, in 1958. And what drove her was seeing someone, a retired educator that she knew, reduced to living in a chicken coop, a chicken house, by poverty wow. in the mid-1940s. So it was in retirement that she volunteered, as she had done throughout her whole life. And in that welfare director's position as a volunteer, she went around Southern California where she was where the majority of her educational background was. And then she found a former teacher of Spanish reduced to living in a chicken house. And that made her so angry. She said, this is America, this should not be. And then she had also seen the, the sort of segregation of older persons in American society. You know, literally, once you pass the age of 65, back then, mandatory retirement, compulsory retirement. So she took action and she formed what would be called a federation. She got together all the then existing separate state retired teachers association and bundled them together into the NRTA. That was 1947. And she worked so hard on pension issues, you know, economic security, health care issues. She realized that many of the companies in America would not insure older persons. So in 1956, nine years before Medicare, she was able to get together a business model of insuring older persons in retirement. And that was nine years before Medicare. 
So she was also what I call a social entrepreneur. Absolutely. And then because all these people saw what she was doing for retired teachers, they wrote to her in the thousands and said, we cannot join, we cannot join as members of NRTA. Can you find something that's more generic for us? It would take her 11 years, but in 1958, she was able to found the American Association of Retired Persons, which is AARP today, almost 38 million strong. You know, and it's interesting, you touch on so many things here that people rarely think about, which mm -hmm. is teaching has, since the beginning of public education, been about women teachers. Yes. Because women, it's one of the few jobs that women could have. Women couldn't be employed. Yes. You could be a secretary, you could be a nurse, you could be a teacher, as long as you weren't married and as long as you didn't have children. Exactly. I mean, it took many years through the 1940s for that to actually change. So that's really important for people to understand as a woman and a former educator, what yes. she was looking at and the fact that women were doomed to poverty, mainly because they didn't have a way to save money. And this is something that I just had a conversation about this yesterday. The greatest threat to women's health is finances. Yes because we live a long time yes. and we outlive our resources. Excellent, this tees it up perfectly for me to tell the listeners and audience here that AARP today, 60 years after its founding, has wonderful resources. AARP has always been nonprofit, nonpartisan, and so on our website, aarp.org forward slash VA for Virginia, there are incredible resources because AARP is all about health security, financial resilience, what we put into like three wonderful buckets of health, wealth, and self. Ah. And that is perfect because when Dr. Andrus founded AARP, she had what we would now call a logo, but back then was called a seal. Okay. And it was a beautiful uh, rendering of an eagle within its talons was a ribbon. And in that ribbon were three words. And think about how powerful and yet how simplistic it is this was the vision that she had for AARP 60 years ago. Independence, dignity, purpose. Wow. And that goes back to what you had said earlier about not only spirituality, but having something that gives you a purpose. And so that's why today, AARP throughout the United States, we have 53 state offices, you know, all the states, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and DC. People come of their own volition to volunteer with AARP carrying on a 60-year legacy of purpose through service in their community. And so it started out early on as a partnership to provide insurance, and still I think you are fighting sort of this idea that AARP means insurance, and you do so much more. Correct. AARP's roots are in making sure that people have dignity, independence. So when Dr. Andrus, through the Retired Teachers Organization, realized that the health security was really shaky if they weren't insured. She worked very hard and was able to get a health insurance policy for retired teachers. So that legacy of what I call market innovation still guides what AARP does today in trying to come up with wonderful benefits for members. AARP does not sell insurance. AARP endorses products for our members knowing that there's number one health security right then there's the wonderful things for travel movies for grown-ups as a matter of fact you know um, here right here in northern virginia there are opportunities for arp members to go and see movies for free often pre-release so the point is is that she understood that in retirement especially for our generation we could live another quarter century that is happening Yes. And you know, and again, there's something called social determinants of health, which mm -hmm. has entered our lexicon recently, talking about the factors that impact health outcomes and your longevity and how they're tied to zip codes. And I think people really need to pay attention to that. Not everybody has the same access to services, to yes. health care, just the housing that you live in, transportation, access to fresh food. All of that impacts your, your health outcomes and certainly your longevity. And for seniors, as they age, it gets to be more difficult, you know, as you lose mobility, as you don't yes. drive anymore, and social isolation, which I think oh. is one of the biggest detriments to the health of seniors. May we recruit you as an AARP Virginia <laughs> volunteer, because you've just hit upon all of the key things that Jim Dow, the AARP Virginia State Director, and his incredible team are working on. Number one, there are advocates, the volunteers who go with the staff, 
up to the Capitol Hill nationally and also to the Commonwealth legislative bodies to fight for the issues, the legislation that will help seniors and older persons in America and in Virginia. Number two, livable communities, aging in place, meaning what needs to be in place? Can you imagine Dr. Andrus? Because she was the founder, she also wrote an editor's column, the founder's column for the magazine, which started in 1958 and then she passed away in 67. The magazine continues to today, but can you imagine what a wealth of information and wisdom we have that she wrote from 1958 until 67, one editorial column every two months. Wow. And in one of them, I found as early as the late 50s, early 60s, she was talking about how long does it take for an older person to cross the street? Are there things in place in your city that make it more beautiful? So she was truly a woman ahead of her time. And all the things that you just named, and brain health. When you think about back in the 50s, she had these wonderful games and things in the magazine. And then there was always a page of jokes. And so she understood the, the changing nature of the brain and how we must engage in society and in our communities to, to stay active. So I would say that we can learn from someone who's almost been lost to history, but who was so ahead of her time. You know, and you bring up a point about women lost to history because there are so, so many women, you know, we have arguments over statues, yes. and our statues are our history. I'm like, well, then where are the women? Yes. <laughs> One of the things I like to point out about the, and I'm a lifelong Virginian, is that the only woman's portrait who hangs in the Capitol building is Pocahontas. Like, really? She was the only one? I think people should look at that and go, there's something inherently wrong with the fact that our history, as we see it and experience it, is bereft of women. Well, that's why I've been very privileged, very honored to go around the United States and talk about her story. In essence, uh, trying to resurrect Dr. Andrus's life story. Because number one, it is exactly what you had said, that one person can make a difference. And when I do my PowerPoint presentation, I often get standing ovations, and I always say it's not about me, it's that the content of the story, the narrative arc of her life, encourages people to understand what they as one person can do. And so I've spoken to retired teachers association gatherings, I've spoken to AARP orientations for their volunteers, I've spoken to outside groups, and the most important thing they say is, I can see myself in her life, that I can have the power to make a difference. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing. Yeah. And when we come back from this break, we are going to talk with Lily further about the remarkable life of AARP's founder. I come from a big family. I'm the oldest of six. To me, being the first person to go to college, it's like setting a standard, you know? My little brother is eight years old now. I challenge his curiosity. I challenge him to dream. I have to paint a picture for him that he can look up to and live up to and possibly be better than. My name is Jacquez, and I am your dividend. Taking care of a family member can lead to plenty of questions. Fortunately, there's a place to get the answers for them and for you. Find articles, tips, and tools from experts and others who have been in your place. The Caregiving Resource Center at aarp.org slash caregiving. I dare you. I dare you to change the world. Yeah, you. Getting that college education. I dare you to be somebody important. Like be a teacher. Or a reality TV star. I dare you to stand up here. To call the shots. To be a role model. An inspiration. An innovator. To be a teacher. Think you can change my life? Make me excited about science like you? Have a career that really means something? Then do it. I dare you. Welcome back to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Joining me today is Lily Liu. She is a, an historian with the AARP, and she is here to tell us about its founder, a woman that many of us may not have heard about. So please continue sort of the story of this remarkable woman. 
Yeah, so, so far I've talked about the fact that it was in her second career that she became the founder of AARP. So I think that's a wonderful idea for people who are now retired or thinking about retired, that there's so much left. She had a wonderful 40-year education um, profession. She was a teacher, she was a principal. As a matter of fact, she was the first woman high school principal in the state of California. Really? So in essence, she was a leader throughout her career. I think though for myself as I'm aging and growing older and trying to think about the next stage of my life, what she did in her retirement is the most powerful. Number one, she was herself a role model, that there is vital aging and that age really is only a number. She founded ARP when she was in her 70s. And then if you think about, she then had another decade or so to write about her vision of what positive aging can be. So I really encourage your listeners and your audience to go on AARP Virginia's website. So it would be www.aarp.org forward slash VA for Virginia, because on it, they will be able to find a sense of community there are opportunities to volunteer. There are opportunities to attend incredible events uh, sponsored by AARP Virginia here in Northern Virginia. In September, there will be Academy for Boomers. It'll be at the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. I know it well. Yes, you've mentioned <laughs> it before in your other shows. And it will be for folks to come and just meet others. So your point of forming a community is so key because Dr. Andrus realized that when she founded that the organization. She wanted people to come together in a sense of community. So think of this, years before we had senior centers, what now people don't want to walk into a senior center, so they've sort of changed their names to wellness centers or community centers, but she had something called a hospitality house in both DC, Long Beach, California, where she had her roots, and also in Florida. And I thought, you know, how interesting, because in Florida, the history would be that people started going down there to retire. Right. They came from the Midwest, they came from other places, they didn't know each other. She had a destination, a hospitality house, right in a central area of St. Petersburg where people could come together. And so your own life story of you know um, championing the power of community, she actually showed what I would call a social experiment. And I think what's really important about that is the so social isolation is so de detrimental to health. Yes. And so many seniors, because they don't know where to go, mm -hmm. or they don't, or they're reluctant to be involved on their own. You know, there are just too many people who sit behind the doors of their homes waiting for yes. their family to come or waiting for, and, and, and I just think that leads to a decline in health. Absolutely. I think there are actual studies that show that. For myself, the lesson learned was when she found that retired teacher reduced to living literally in a chicken house because of poverty. She years later wrote about it and she said, that woman disappeared from her friend's sight and memory. That is a powerful lesson for me in the sense that that woman was lost to society. And so Dr. Andrus in her retirement, her own retirement, could see this, the, the uh, lengthening of longevity in America, better health for older persons, but then also why was society not tapping that wonderful resource? And so she hit upon a time when both the government, academia, the social sector were saying there's a vast untapped resource in older persons. And she was able to have people come into this vision of hers, which today, 60 years later, has almost 38 million members. I know, and, I, and I'm too, segregation of older people has always bothered me too. Right. Because I think there's plenty of um, benefit to be derived from intergenerational Yes. So I work with an organization called Grand Involve, and we put retired seniors into the classroom of Title I elementary schools yes. here in Fairfax. Yes. And in hearing the volunteers talk about the benefit they get from these children, exactly. and the benefit the children get from having these yes. older people who care about them and nurture them and mentor them, in, I, we need to find more ways in which we are not just saying we're putting older people over here. Correct separate and apart from over here. Correct. We need to figure out more ways to make intergenerational connections possible. That's what she did. She was very pro, because you know, she was an educator. She was a high school teacher and principal. So she understood the power of putting generations together. So if you think about at the beginning of ARP coming up with its motto, which today we still use, to serve, not to be served. 
that is very biblical first of all she knew her bible but also the power of that to say that we have so much to give to give back to society to give back to our communities and as a result when she passed away in july of 67 subsequently then president johnson wrote a beautiful two paragraph testimonial to compliment her on her accomplishment which is enduring and which you know he was very um to foreshadow that the organization that she grew to now today 60 years later is still in existence and helping older persons all over both and, the United States. And 38 States. million strong. Yes. I mean, that's 38 million people, a lot of people who are members of the AARP. Because they see something that is powerful in being part of that community. And let's talk about the arc of retirement, too. I wish we could think of some other word besides retirement, because retirement to me sounds like the end of something. Mm-hmm. I like when people talk about the encore years. Like, yes. what is your, what are your encore years going to look like? Because it makes it sound like there's a next act which there is a next act, but there are people who are pre-retirement, like I'm 56, Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. I'm not a retiree, but but AARP takes members starting at 50, so you have this group of people who are like pre-retirement, then you've got people who are planning their retirement, Mm -hmm. then you've got people who are newly retired, and a lot of them do a lot of traveling and other kinds of things, but as we age into the decades, Mm -hmm. things change for lots of reasons, things change. You may not travel as much, there might be mobility issues Mm -hmm. or other kinds of issues, so you find yourself more local. Yes. So AARP really has this spectrum of programs and services and opportunities for people no matter where they are. Absolutely. She actually had a word. She had it as refirement. 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 Okay. Because she understood that it was a progression in life. And so that's why AARP membership begins at 50, because you need to plan ahead. And in a way, in America, in the Western world, this sort of arbitrary 65, right? She fought very hard against compulsory retirement. She knew that it wasn't just like one day you're working and the next day you're not, right? Because in this society, we're often defined by our own professions. She also did things in a very clever way. As I continue to do research about her life and her accomplishments, she had legislative work. She had volunteers go up who were trained in advocacy issues. ARP, as you recall, is nonpartisan, but we can be political. So I'm hoping that people will understand that this year AARP has a very important getting people out to vote, make a difference, be the difference, vote. So people can sign a pledge and say that they will vote in the upcoming elections. So that's participation in civic engagement. Right. Then she knew that people wanted to do things, so she actually started something called chapters, which are separately incorporated. The first one was in Youngtown, Arizona in 1960. So I often thought she must have had a marketing background to have the (laughs) first one be Youngtown. But the point of what I'm saying is that she knew people wanted to do something and each person might have a different type of interest. So she actually used a play back then when it was you know mandatory retirement to show the progression of a man facing inevitable retirement, becoming very depressed and sad, but then because he was able to find purpose through a volunteer um, opportunity and all, he became a more happy person. So she was, I always say she was coming out with all, all um, barrels blazing in the sense that she did advocacy, she did information education, she had opportunities for volunteerism, but she also used the creative arts to get across her message. That's interesting. It reminds me of a book I love called A Man Called Ova, Uh Frederick Bachman, and it really talks about this curmudgeonly guy who ends up thinking there's nothing to live for until the series of these people come into his life. It's a remarkable book, but it's kind of what you're talking about, understanding that, you know, there is so many different chapters to all of our lives, Mm -hmm. and sometimes we're not prepared for them, or we don't understand what the opportunities are yes we haven't looked for them right and that's why this 60th anniversary year is going to be so key there is a um, opportunity through the magazine there was a solicitation for folks to write in and say how has ARP changed your life you know I can't wait to read what members and the readers will submit there are going to be opportunities like Jim Dow and his team here at ARP Virginia to hold community events and I'm hoping it will draw more volunteers into the AARP family because just last night I was at something where there was a first time volunteer and she just came out and you know just dove right in and she left with such a grin on her face and I thought that's the power of what Dr. Andrew said to serve not to be served. Yeah and I, and I think the other thing we have to get away from is not thinking that AARP means old people. 
Absolutely. You know, you're only as old as you think you are, and age really is a number. I mean, you're not an old person if you don't think you're an old person. Well, it's more than that. AARP's CEO, Joanne Jenkins, has a wonderful initiative called Disrupt Aging. And in essence, it's why are we so caught up in stereotypes right? and ageism? My goodness. There's a lot of that. Right? And so the point would be to take Dr. Andrus's spirit and say, at each stage of life, there are different things, but there's still so much real possibilities, which is AARP's you know, key point right now is in your life, there are so many real possibilities. Go out and explore them and see what it holds. You know, I guess I'm more fortunate than most people. My grandmother uh, was the first superintendent of public welfare for the city of Radford, oh. Virginia. Ah. And she retired at the age of 70. <laughs> but I think the only reason she retired is that a boyfriend that had left her life many years before found her, courted her, and they got married. And I was a bridesmaid in my grandmother's wedding when she was 70. That is a wonderful story. And then story. she left and went to Florida and had a whole other life down there. Yes. So I saw that firsthand as a child. Yeah. So my perception of the possibilities as we get older is dramatically affected by the fact that she was a remarkable woman in her own right. But to up and get married at the age of 70 and to just start over again in Florida, pretty remarkable. Well, you are a chip off her block because you have done so many different things in your life. But the most important thing that you're doing now is providing a megaphone to have community leaders come in and talk. So I hope you'll be able to invite more of the AARP Virginia colleagues. We have advocacy colleagues. We have colleagues who are out there doing community outreach. And so, you know, the place to start would be to go online and look at aarp.org forward slash Virginia VA. But then also to have these colleagues come in and talk about different things. I know that I personally have made a point of going out to speak in Asian American communities. My father had died very suddenly and I became the family caregiver for my mom. Mm -hmm. And so I realized there are differences in being um, of a different immigrant background. Right. So we have this wonderful resource called Prepare to Care and it's for um, everybody in the community and now it's been translated into Spanish as well as Chinese. And so I realized that AARP's work really cuts across, as you said, generations, communities of different ethnic background that we're all, I think maybe the one thing we can say that we all share in common is we're, if we're lucky, we age, right? That's the one thing we share in common. And that is a wonderful thought with which to close our program. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is what you need to know about the AARP.